Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and uh, it's very good to see some people that I recognise in the uh, in the attendees so far, and just some new names as well. Uh, my name's Ellis, so I look after the CPD program here at Raytech. Um, before we get into the the main body of the presentation, just a few ground rules. So, firstly, everybody will be muted uh, for the whole presentation. Uh, however, there will be a Q&A session towards the end, so you should have a questions box where you can uh, and, uh, ask any questions as we go along through the presentation, and after which I'll read them out one by one, go through them uh, as we can, and uh, hopefully everybody can come out of this uh, with a bit more knowledge than they went in at the start. So what we'll be going through today is uh, our, our one-hour lunch and learn. Uh, or otherwise uh, online webinar for specifying lighting for smarter surveillance. So this should go on for approximately 30 to 45 minutes. I'll uh, try not to uh, blab on for too long uh, so you can uh, stay well aware of what's going on. And uh, yeah, we'll continue. So what we'll be looking at today is, first of all, very simply, why do we need surveillance lighting? Why do we need infrared and white light for our cameras? And then we'll be going on to important criteria that we need to look at with regards to what we're specifying. And then look at camera and lens considerations. So once we know exactly what we're specifying, how do we go about specifying it? What considerations do we need to take into account? And finally, essentially, it's a little thought piece. So where do we see the market going in the future? And what can you look forward to with regards to new developments and uh, new technologies in LED lighting? So why do we need it? Why do we need surveillance lighting? I think many of our UK viewers might recognize this image already. And this is from uh, a few years ago now, actually. It's uh, from a, a very popular TV show in the UK called Springwatch. And uh, the customer in this case, he bought some Raytech lamps actually to look at foxes in his back garden. And uh, he essentially got to see a lot more than I think he, he expected originally. And he ended up uh, capturing an image of a man breaking into his garden shed. And with these images was later able to prosecute him. So it's these kind of images that simply wouldn't be possible if you didn't have uh, enough light in any specific area that your cameras are viewing. If it was complete darkness in the back there, uh, essentially he, he would never have found, he would never have seen this uh, the criminal damage that was being undertaken. So first and foremost, we need light in order to see. However, I think as technology is developed, this light that's primarily aimed to, to assist your security cameras in order to see can be used for so much more now. Um, something that we're seeing a, a big uptake in more recent times, maybe over the past year and a half, is the use of security lighting that's multi-purposeful. So rather than it just being there to assist your cameras, and in this case it would be to assist getting color images, we can also use it for general area lighting. So walkways, car parks, front of buildings, et cetera. So they are, they're still assisting your cameras, but they're also, they've got a second purpose and their purpose is to achieve minimum levels of light that any one particular area requires. The next is analytics. And again, I think, with the development of camera technologies, with the development of uh, software, Analytics is becoming so, so powerful. You know, we're seeing it all the time, all this facial recognition technology, uh, brand new AMPR systems, etc. And while they're, they're fantastic at what they do, one thing that they absolutely require is very, very good images in order to process that and analyze it and to get the, uh, in this case, it would be motion detection or uh, identification of a human intruder. We've had the uh, the benefit of working with some of the top camera manufacturers in, in the world. And uh, we've done real life applications for customers in the UK and abroad, where with the introduction of external infrared, we can actually get better nighttime accuracy, uh, better accuracy 
at night time than we can during the day. So with supplementary infrared, we can get better analytics than with sunlight. And I think that's where you can start to see the true power of actually using external lighting, especially when you're going for uh, having analytics. Alongside analytics, cameras are getting smarter, the software behind them is getting smarter, both two are lamps. We've seen a big development in IP lighting, and this is primarily aimed at using lighting actively rather than just having something that comes on when it's dark and turns off when it's light. It can be used actively when an event is happening. And the primary reason to do this would be obviously to deter crime. So rather than just using images post event to, to take somebody to court, for example, you can use the lighting in that specific area. Maybe it's down a fence line outside of a building to deter crime from happening at the point of entry. And that ultimately, I think, is the aim of, it should be the aim of any security system. Finally, as a, as a very simple basis, having better lighting on scene can reduce the, uh, the, the strain on the rest of your uh, security infrastructure. So by having better nighttime images, so by having more light, you reduce the amount of noise on scene. And this in turn reduces the amount of bandwidth, the amount of storage that you require in order to process those images. So having more light will reduce that strain on the rest of your system. So why LED? Why would we go for LED over the, the old school bulb technologies? And I think this is probably everybody in, on the uh, call today probably is aware of this. You know, LEDs are longer lasting. They have uh, no ma uh, maintenance. They're cost effective. They're more efficient. Ultimately, the, the more advanced technology. However, not all LEDs are the same, and we've seen a big increase again in terms of uh, cheaper LEDs, very, very cheap LEDs coming from uh, the East and Asia. However, they're not good quality. They don't have good product design, and more importantly, quite often it's the case that the thermal control isn't suitable for the, uh, the product. And the thermal aspect is actually one of the biggest uh, points that I want to raise in this particular part is that when you look at one of our products or when you look at uh, an LED, a well-designed LED product, you'll notice that the majority of it is heat sink. And there's a reason for this. And that's because heat retention uh, when you're powering LEDs is the biggest killer. Um, you need to get rid of that heat in order to ensure that your LEDs are going to perform at their most efficient and their most effective. And it's not just efficiency, it's also the lifespan of the product. So a general term that uh, people, uh, that manufacturers will uh, use is the L70 approach to determining the lifespan of a product. And this is when the product has become uh, reduced in power over the years to 70% of its maximum original power. And that's where they state the, uh, the, the end lifespan of the product is, or the, the average lifespan of the product is. And this is very, very determined by the amount of uh, heat that builds up in that product. As you can see, the temperature junction, uh, which is the point behind the LED, the hotter that is, the quicker the LED will uh, scale off in terms of the overall lifespan. So if we say the uh, the blue and the, the brown lines there, if the blue is our uh, example LED, the brown one probably doesn't have, uh, it either perhaps has poor quality LEDs or it has poor design uh, with much larger heat retention and that can massively cut off your lifespan by a factor of tens of thousands of years which obviously, you know, average lifespan of a, in a good quality LED product, we would say is 10 years. You can see that halved at least. The next factor is the energy consumption side. So LED products are so much more efficient than the old bulb-based technologies. And for this, we, um, we have a, a very nice case study of a hospital that we worked with uh, a couple of years ago now, and in which case we were replacing 100 400 watt metal halide lamps uh, with 170 watt LED lamps. 
So by doing so, we saved the company 220,000 pounds over the uh, lifespan of the product, which is 10 years. So that's a return on investment of, of in two years, essentially, which is absolutely massive. Kind of makes it almost a no-brainer that LEDs as we know them are the way forward. There's no, there's no reason why you wouldn't use LED over the old bulb-based technologies. So with that in mind, what do you need to look at? And this is the main point that we want to stress on today. What, as, do you as specifiers, what do you need to be looking at when you're introducing uh, security lighting, when you're specifying it, when you're putting it into a tender? The first thing is simply what do you need? What, what are your operational requirements? So you've got, essentially you've got three different technologies that you can go with. The first one is infrared. So very simply, it's covert lighting. Uh, there's two main wavelengths that uh, most manufacturers use. Uh, the first is which is 850 nanometers. So this is what we would describe as semi-covert. Uh, from the lamp source, you can see a faint red glow, but you wouldn't be able to see it in the environment. The next level is 940 nanometers, and we see this as a much more specialist uh, wavelength of light. So while it's completely covert, even from the point from the source of the lamp, uh, the, unfortunate, uh, the unfortunate side effect of that is that you will see far lower distances. And this is because the cameras simply aren't receptive to that wavelength, or aren't as receptive to that wavelength of light. So while it's got that benefit that it's completely invisible, you end up needing far more light in order to achieve the same distances. Uh, infrared as a, as a standard uh, is longer distance than the other wavelengths of light, mainly white light or visible light. Um, obviously, as it's covert, that's perfect when you're working in areas where light pollution is quite a big issue or you want to have some, a security system that isn't absorbable from uh, afar. The next thing to look at is white light. So white light, obviously, as we've discussed, is multipurposeful. It can assist your cameras to see color images, but it can also be act as a visual deterrent. It can act as in, for increased safety or general area lighting. And more recently, we've seen an in, uh, or there's been development of hybrid lamps, so lamps that introduce both infrared and white light into a single panel that can be used for your covert surveillance, but also white light on demand. And this actually can really reduce the, uh, the amount of products that you require as well. So in this particular circumstance, this is a um, high security site uh, in the UK. Uh, it's got, obviously, as you can see, white light lamps and infrared lamps. And this, the replacement or modern version of this would be the image on the, on the right there, where it's just got one lamp that can provide both of those. And with double stack LEDs, you can receive the same amount of power uh, from that one half of the lamp uh, as you would a, a dedicated white light lamp or a dedicated infrared lamp. So they're extremely powerful and a very good method of going forward. The next thing to look at is the distance and angle. So Obviously, distance is super important. You need to know how far you want the light to travel. However, you'd be surprised how many people come to us thinking, you know, that is the be all and end all. Obviously, it, as you're widening that field of view, despite the lamp giving out the same amount of power, you can vastly reduce the distance that you're you're actually achieving. So from 10 to 35, you're, you're practically halving the distance. So you really need to keep that in mind. And of course, making sure that the angle matches that of your camera field of view is is equally as important as actually achieving the maximum distance so as we can see here we want to make sure that uh, the image on the left doesn't occur where you've got the distance is probably uh, about right but unfortunately field of view just isn't anywhere near what we need it to be the second image there is simply you've got the field of view, it's wide enough, but you're not getting maximum power to fulfill to, to fill the entire length of the image. Third one along, essentially there's just not enough power and probably when you're zooming in, that's restricting the amount of light that's hitting your sensor. And then finally, on the end there, that's what we would consider the perfect level of light. So it's even across the scene, uh, very detailed, and no matter where you're zooming in there, you'll be able to get a good image out of it. And that's even more 
important nowadays when we're seeing panoramic uh, PTZ cameras, multi-sensor cameras, etc., that can cover extremely wide uh, areas, but they need the light in order to to fill all of that up. So you need to ensure that if you've got a you know a multi-sensor camera that's looking 180 degrees, 270 degrees, what have you, you need to make sure that you're lighting up that entire area in order to get the most use out of your camera. No point spending a lot on very nice cameras and then not having them fulfill all, the, all you know, to their full value. Uh, the next thing you need to look at is, is what's the purpose of the light? And this is really with regards to uh, CCTV against general areas. So CCTV, we will quote you uh, a, a minimum light on spec, but on the vertical plane. Obviously, an intruder or somebody that you're wanting to, to see will be on the vertical plane and that's where you need the light so that it's reflecting right back into the camera lens. On the flip side, general area usually would be looking down onto scene. So we measure light on the ground level. Obviously, if you imagine there's a walkway or a path, it's the, it's the ground that they're wanting to see, not the person on top of it. And this is, I, this is actually probably the most important of the uh, most important part of the presentation. That's the minimum requirements. So over over the years, as Raytech have done hundreds and hundreds of tests with various cameras from manufacturers, both what from we would consider low end to high end, we see this as the minimum requirements that you should be specifying in your uh, tenders and your projects in order to get the best quality CCTV images. And we really see this as, this is non-preferential, this is not favoring one manufacturer over the other. This is simply the minimum amount of light that you should expect to see on any at any given distance in order to get the, the quality image that you should want. So that's 0 0.35 microwatts per square centimeter for your infrared and three lux for white light. And obviously, just to give you an example of uh, where this kind of fits in in terms of the minimum light level. So for walkways for pedestrians, we're looking at 10 lux. For car parks with slow moving vehicles, we've got, uh, sorry, 10 lux. Pedestrians, five lux. So three lux for CCTV is really low. If you if you imagine that as a, as a visible light, it's not very high, but that's all the cameras actually need in order to get a good image. And then this is the same for infrared. Obviously with infrared, it's it's more difficult because you can't see it. And this is the problem that we've seen in the industry so far in that people will spec distances uh, with no clear indication of how that is measured, uh, but they don't, they, don't, they don't help you because that distance could be, you know, at the half of level of light as, a, as another illuminator spec to the same 100 meters, for example. And what you want is to make sure that the, the playing field is completely even, that you're comparing apples for apples. And that is how we can do it by having a minimum level of light. Of course, there is a level of uh, you know interpretation for this. So if you're using a high performance, perhaps low light camera, you might be able to get away with a little bit less light than uh, you know your middle uh, low to mid range camera. However, we would definitely recommend uh, doing some active testing and. Uh, I'm sure any manufacturer that you speak to nowadays will be happy to do uh, free of charge demos and perhaps uh, free night testing. And that's something that Raytech would, uh, would honor as well. So camera considerations, high megapixel cameras. Uh, obviously over the years, cameras are becoming more and more powerful. Uh, we're seeing the megapixel count increase dramatically. You've got 4K, 8K, even higher cameras nowadays. and Whenever you're stepping up, you're getting so much more detail, but that camera also needs so much more light in order to get a good quality image. Uh, if we look, you know, back 10 years ago when we were using all analog cameras, the amount of light that you needed to get a, a perfectly sufficient uh, image out of it was actually pretty low. You didn't need a lot of light. You could just use a small illuminator and it would work well. However, with these modern cameras, you need so much more. The way I always think this is probably a bad anagram, uh, anagram if that's the right word, but I like to think of each pixel as a bucket 
Um, so if you're using, say you've got twice as many pixels, but using the same amount of light, then each pixel is going to be uh, half as full. Now, obviously, that's not a, a direct correlation with reality, but that's the way I think about it in my head. And uh, with our testing, um, that's definitely true out in the field as well. The next thing to think about is zooming. So if you've got a perimeter fence line, for example, and you're looking 500 meters, which seems an incredibly long distance, um, but often it's the case nowadays that cameras have a good enough lens in order to zoom all the way into that, uh, to the far extent of, you, uh, of that distance in order to see, um, maybe not identify, but at least, uh, or maybe not recognize, but identify an intruder. However, when you're zooming in, you need to factor in that you're reducing the amount of light that actually is going to hit your sensor. So again, this is the flip side of, you know, if you're using a low light camera, you maybe need less light. If you're planning on zooming in onto a location, then perhaps you need more light. Uh, a good example of this is a project that we got involved up in Scotland. And uh, they wanted, it was a well-known area for, uh, for uh, uh, basically for people selling drugs. And uh, what would they would do is they would stand in doorways um, and they wanted to see people actively exchanging the goods so that they could take them to court later on. Unfortunately, what they realized is they had a, a very nice low light camera and when they were zoomed all the way out, image looked absolutely fine. There was enough ambient light for, every, for them to see the whole, uh, whole scene, essentially. However, when they zoomed in to, onto these doorways, because they were under shade, away from the ambient light, they couldn't see anything. And they had to then go out back at a later date to specify individual illuminators that would pick out these key locations so that they could actually see into those doorways and pick up the, uh, the, the, the people exchanging, exchanging goods, I guess you could say. And we did a test uh, just uh, a few months ago to, to try and make this as an example. So this is using uh, an Axis Q-Series PTZ, so a good quality camera in our view. Um, the image on the left there, I think you could say that was a very good image. Um, on the very basis of it, it's got enough ambient light on scene to, to, to essentially, it looks like a good image. You'd be happy with that, I think, if you set it up at night and that was your first night uh, getting test shots. On the right there, there's a slight improvement, and this is with uh, our Vario i8 lamp. So there's a slight improvement in terms of the, the light on scene. Uh, however, it's not, it's not a drastic change. It's not a massive improvement. However, when you zoom in, when you actually look into the scene, that is when you can see the difference. On the image on the left there, you can see the, the one of my colleagues in this case is, uh, is covered in shadow. You're not going to get good image quality out of that. You're never going to be, that's not a usable image at the end of the day. Image on the right there was just a small amount of infrared uh, to increase the light on scene. And more importantly, infrared that is alongside your camera so that it's directional. That gives you the perfect image and you would be able to use that. And that's another very important point is when we're looking at general area lighting, it's very, very uh, scene specific. And uh, when I say that, I mean, in some cases, low light will be fine. You'll get exactly what you need out of the camera, depending on where that lighting is located. However, to be safe or to get, you know, 100% results, we would always say use an external light alongside your camera. And this is, also the case that the lamp should be external to the camera as well. So in this particular, in these couple of example shots, we have uh, on the left there, we've got uh, the same camera as on the right, um, but with the left-hand shot, the lamp is external to the camera and on the right-hand side, it is internal. One of the problems that we find with internal uh, infrared is that a, it can reflect off a dome if you're using a dome PTZ, which obviously will spoil your images. Or B, in this circumstance, the field of view isn't actually quite what it would say on the tin. And when you're zooming in or zooming out, it's fixed at a certain point, And you're going to get either, you know, hot spot in the middle where it's overexposing an individual or dark patches along the sides. And it's going to lead to uh, missed data or uh, you're going to miss 
crucial information. The other problem with having infrared internal in the camera is the heat buildup. So as we previously discussed, uh, heat obviously is bad for LEDs. It's going to ruin the, uh, the lifespan of the, the product overall. Uh, so if you've got it built into the camera, of course, there's no way that heat can escape. So you're going to see a big drop off of uh, power over time. So as far as the lamp goes, you could see a, a big reduction on top of on, on against what we would say is like the standard lifespan of an LED product. Uh, the other problem with having that heat buildup actually inside of your camera is uh, is insects. So insects are uh, uh, attracted to that heat, and uh, this is a this is a video that one of our customers actually sent in, uh, where he had some crazy spiders obviously in his back garden uh, that were very very attracted to his cameras and uh, as you can see if you've got analytics if this is a remote site for example uh, that's going to just trigger so many false alarms and each false alarm you know if you have to get somebody to site uh, manned guards etc it's it's, it's going to be money at the end of the day and even if it's not this bad obviously this is a bit of a, a perfect worst case scenario but even if it's just part of your CCTV image, that's still going to trigger uh, motion detection, venue analytics, and uh, ultimately, it, it, this is obviously going to spoil your uh, CCTV images. I do also just like watching this video. I think uh, it's like watching National Geographic or something. So I think you, you're happy with that in terms of LED light is the way forward. Uh, it should be external to the camera. You, you know infrared, white light, hybrid, what you need to specify and where. Um, what kind of cameras can we link it up with? And um, we see a big increase in the amount of uh, camera manufacturers that are bringing out thermal cameras. And I think this is quite regional specific. I used to look after South Africa and uh, South Africa is thermal is super prominent. Everybody uses thermal cameras because, of course, they've got manned guards everywhere. So detection is the key aim there. You know, people want to uh, detect an individual, have a somebody with a gun go over, and you know, they they will be the eyes. However, for other regions, it's not just detection that's the most important point. Uh, thermals are great at detection, but what they can't do is identify an individual or recognize an individual. So that's where you would have a, a thermal camera and an overview camera with infrared or white light and uh, that will give you your detection and you can use that for your analytics and then that will also give you the infrared and overview camera will give you, uh, you your identification your recognition so then you can take that image and that can also support thermal camera so if you do have guards even at least they have more to go off rather than just as an individual on scene uh, they can say what they're wearing, um, if it's male, female, ex for example, and it gives you a, a more wealth of information from the same camera image. So design basics. What do we need to look at if we are designing a tender and we've got a, 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 a site drawing in front of us? What do we need to go through to make sure everything's linked up together, right? Um, the first one is height. So this kind of goes back to your general area versus security lighting. Um, if we imagine security lighting, you want to be aiming at an individual. So you want it lower down. We say about four to five meters uh, would be the perfect scenario where you want it about a meter away from your camera, but alongside it. And then for general area lighting, because you want it uh, facing downwards, but you want to increase that spread of light as far as you can, then six to eight meters plus for general area lighting, depending on the size of the lamp that you're using is what we would consider the perfect scenario. And um, mounting, so the, the, the top image there isn't necessarily a bad image. It's just obviously very cluttered. Uh, I think the best case scenario for us or what we would most likely recommend to a customer is to use uh, your lamp, like I said before, make sure it's a meter away from your camera. Uh, in this circumstance, especially when it's a dome camera, because the dome will uh, 
potentially reflect that infrared back into your camera lens and cause some shadowing and uh, that, that can obviously ruin your camera images. Um, you want it adjacent to the camera but in any direction. So we often get asked this as in terms of like where should we mount it, you know, does it need to be above or below? Ultimately it doesn't matter. What the, the most important factor is that you are angling it up alongside the field of view of your camera. So one, uh, we'll now and again receive images where people will say, oh, the lamp isn't performing to spec. And that's often because they've slightly incorrectly angled it so that they're not filling up the whole field of view of the, of the screen. And if they just tilted it down a little bit more, they would find actually that they uh, get far better images out of it. And as we say, dome camera is at least a, a meter away. With box cameras, not so important. Obviously, you've got you've often got the weatherproof shrouds, for example, that can uh, that can save uh, any ish issues with regards to glare. Uh, this might one this one might seem slightly obvious, but it's important to have all of your cameras facing in one direction. Um, again. It's it's almost heartbreaking when we see a, a side design come in and uh, you've got cameras that are, are perhaps 15 meters away, but they're pointing directly at each other. And you just think you're making it so much harder on yourself by doing that because at a later date when it's actually being installed, to ensure that there's no glare in that opposing camera, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, and that, that's going to be the case no matter what kind of lights that you're using. So then it's a case of clever installation work to make it correct, when realistically, if you just have it, have cameras and lights all in a linear fashion, that'll make the whole installation process a lot easier for everybody. Design basics for general area. So first of all, this is where you need to think about application. Um, what is the what well, is it a car park is it a path um obviously you can refer to the standards that are in your particular country in the uk we would refer to the british standard which has every scenario listed and the minimum amount of light that they need and uh, again is this general area lighting only or is it to support uh, cameras in which case you perhaps want to angle the lights in certain ways so that you're still getting uh, good color images out of it and this goes along with the mounting height as well, because if it's general area, you perhaps don't want it at eight meters, because if you're trying to pick up a, a subject that's only a few meters away, you're only going to get the top of the top of the person. You're not going to get the full person in the shot. And then average illuminance is obviously very important. As we say, you know, you're needing to hit minimum specification in terms of uh, lux levels on scene for general area. You need to make sure that you're able to hit that. And then uniformity, ensuring that you don't have shadows in some places and uh, too much light in other. And this is where having a lighting design can help massively. So uh, as a company, uh, we offer full lighting design service. And uh, essentially, especially when it comes to white light, this is absolutely mandatory. You need to make sure that uh, the position of the lamps, the angle of the lamps will uh, achieve what you require. Uh, again, if you're uh, comparing against older technologies, you need to make sure that it, it, you can't just swap like for like. You need to make sure that the specific lamp you're using will provide enough light in order to achieve your requirements. So power requirements. This one, I think, has changed quite a lot recently uh, and perhaps over even just the past few years in terms of originally, Mains voltage probably was the uh, the standard approach. You would get a mains voltage lamp with its own PSU, and uh, you would use it in that setup. Uh, then there was a lot of low voltage lamps, so universal low voltage, 12 to 24 volts AC DC makes setup a lot easier because you can just use third party PSUs or you can use the PSU on site already. Granted, it's compatible. And then recently, we've seen a lot of PoE lighting. Um, again, this this just increases the amount of ease that you as installers, uh, specifiers, etc., uh, have with regards to putting a lamp in your system. You can link it up to the existing uh, switch or uh, uh, injector, and uh, the lamp will work as required. And then you need to think about the flexibility and control that you want over the lamp. 
So this is with regards to more intelligent lighting, where it's not just something that comes on when it's dark and turns off when it's light. Perhaps you want to be able to adjust the power. So if we go back to our 500 meter fence line scenario, if you've got a lamp that's capable of 500 meters, but a subject is, is five meters away, you know, there's no, there's no technology that can stop it from being overexposed at that distance. Perhaps in that kind of circumstance, you would want somebody to turn the light down. Um, sensitivity adjust uh, for the power, for the photo cell, uh, timer functions, do you want to be able to address it over an IP network, etc. So just to give you a few examples of where this can be used uh, to, to the end user's benefit, or even the installer in this case. So remote setup, um, first of all, you don't need to be up on, a, on a, a ladder or a cherry picker changing settings. You can mount the light, direction it, and then you can change all the settings over the IP network. Uh, this actually refers to that uh, long range premise fence line. So if you've got somebody taking manual control of the light, they come closer to the, uh, to the camera, you can turn the light down so that no overexposure is occurring. Uh, if you have uh, an entry point, for example, and there's an unrecognized character in this circumstance, operator can uh, trigger the lights to turn on at maximum brightness, uh, boost or deterrent flash patterns. And then these can all be automated as well. And that's, that's the, I guess, the beauty of having a, uh, an IP lamp that is fully connected to the wider infrastructure. So perhaps you have a fence line, you've got uh, smart uh, fencing, uh, smart cabling, fiber along the fence line. Somebody goes over, tries to jump the fence, that would trigger the light or that could trigger the light in that specific area to go into a flash pattern where all the rest of them go in 100%. We've got quite a nice case study uh, in Vegas where this was um, replicated really nicely with the use of thermal cameras as well. And uh, they essentially separated their, it was a high-end residential project and they, um, they separated the garden into quadrants. So if somebody hopped the fence in one quadrant, all of the lights would flash in that particular area and all of the other lights would go on at 100%. So somebody looking at that would know exactly where the intruder was and would know exactly where to go. Um, IP lighting can also be used very nicely for general area uh, applications. So in this circumstance, we've got a car park, uh, perhaps nobody is around, not in use, reduce the light to 20%, the power is not, you're saving power, you're maximizing the life of the product. And then when a car comes in, this could be picked up by PIR, motion detection, et cetera. Uh, this could trigger the lights to achieve your minimum light levels as before. And this is this is the really clever use of lighting that I think as uh, security installers or security professionals, we don't always think about immediately, that actually your security lighting can have a lot of different facets. It can, it can fulfill a lot of different requirements, not just to ensure that your cameras can see better at nighttime. So what do we see as being the future of LED lighting. Firstly, uh, I think it goes without question that the performance increase in LEDs has, has been massive over the last few years. Uh, in some products, we, we've seen 200% increase by changing out the LEDs, uh, increase in power output by changing LEDs to the, the most uh, up-to-date versions, variations. And the flip side of that is while the performance is going up, the cost is actually reducing. So uh, LED technology is becoming more cost effective as a solution and is becoming more of a, a worthwhile uh, addition to your security system as a, as a percentage. Functionality is increasing and also the benefit of being able to power it in essentially any way that you want, including PoE. And the future is connected. So, we as a company see that uh, IP lighting is, is, is the way forward. Having lamps that uh, become part of your system uh, is, is the ultimate benefit of these products. Uh, cameras, VMS softwares, uh, PIR, smart fencing, et cetera, everything is becoming smarter and smarter as time goes on. It, makes, it only makes sense that the lighting, which is a crucial part of your security system, uh, becomes a part of that. And this 
is the ultimate aim for us, I think. Uh, as a company, we're, we're looking to develop the IP products. Um, and, and that is where we see the market as a whole going forward. So thank you.